Two years ago, Americans watched in horror as a crisis unfolded at the Kabul airport. There's desperation and anguish. More than 80,000 Afghans have since arrived in America. But this story is still unfolding. I'm Andrea Smartin. In my new podcast, Stranger Becomes Neighbor, we'll find out what happens to these new arrivals in our communities. Who would help our newest neighbors? Follow us at kslpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. Welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. And, well, recovery is brought to you by Pinnacle Recovery Center. That's where I started my road to recovery. If you know somebody that needs some help, reach out and find it. Hey, I'm Casey Scott. That is Dr. Matt Woolley. We got John Smith running the board. And uh, today you've got your own show kind of in mind, Dr. Matt. Well, I thought that we'd uh, take a a second and talk a little bit. I want to catch up with you. Okay. First of all, um, and I want to talk. I have an idea about how to how to um, talk about kind of your type of drinking because we've we've talked about excessive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That was the word. Uh, I'm gonna put a, we're gonna put a little spin on that, but yeah, definitely excessive. Um, you know, people uh, their recovery is their own, and there are also some very individual things about how they drink and how they abuse substances. We'll talk about that, but I wanted I want that conversation to lead into. How uh, how is that affecting kids these days, underage drinking, what parents can do about it? And at the end, we're going to kind of hit up a little list of things, uh, uh, talking points that parents can, uh, helpful things that if they think their kid is struggling or might be struggling with alcohol. But let's start with, how are you doing? Give I think uh, I get a lot of feedback. People want updates on, um, you know, how's Casey doing? Nobody ever asks how I'm doing. Well, I'm fine. Because I'm you're, doing fine. You're a doctor. Because <laughs> doctors have no problems. Did you know that, that uh, doctors, physicians, and and people in the medical field have a pretty high rate of substance abuse? Yeah, you know what? I'm starting to learn that because since we've launched this podcast, I've had a lot of people reach out to me. And uh, we're going to try to get them on the show, and we want yeah. you to continue to reach out to us. But a, a lot of firefighters, a lot of yep. first responders, first responders yeah. a lot of uh, doctors and nurses, uh-huh. uh, you know, is going, hey, look, we, we, we live in a stress-filled work environment. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, kind of like you were joking, I know you're joking, but a lot of times people um, – I think think that oh they're a doctor they're a nurse they're above all of that and actually they I mean doctor MD and nurses their their schedules are so stressful they're so long um, they deal with so much um, it can be very uh, traumatic for them and so there's a lot of folks that turn they they might I mean they're tightening up the rules but they might have a little bit easier access to prescription medicines and other or things. Or they know you people. Know. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and I think that plays into my story a little bit. You know, a lot of people thought that I just had everything mm-hmm. going for me. I was on TV, you know, everything. Yeah. And everybody's job is stressful. And right. mine was just highlighted because I was on TV. But I think that 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 goes to show you how big of epidemic and problem it is, is that it's not just uni- – it, it's universal, I should say. It is it is universal. While the jobs and the stressors are different, that need to alleviate your stress at the end of the day or during the day, you know, that's universal. And, and, and sometimes we don't want to take the time to meditate. I, med- I meditated this morning, um, which is a good thing because I've already had a really busy day. Um, but that takes a few – that takes calming down and sitting down. And sometimes you just want it to – go away, you know. So, you know, I've talked a lot about our Facebook page and my Facebook page and people reaching out to me and a lot of people saying, hey, you're doing so great. You're kicking butt. And Mm -hmm. and I love that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. But it does throw a little added pressure on me because I want to make sure that I'm doing my best. And all I can really do is do my best. But I mean, there's days that I I don't want to get out of bed. There's days that I I, I don't want to deal with my kids. And Mm -hmm. I just I just want to shout from from anywhere and just go leave me alone and yeah. the reality is I can't do that mm-hmm. but I do need to take time for self love and self care right. and, and do things that are important to me and remind myself that if I'm not doing good for me I can't do good for anybody else yeah that's that's a really important thing to keep in mind a lot of people who are parents or uh, maybe you have a job where you're managing others and doing things uh, a lot of other oriented people end up not taking care of themselves and then at the end of the day or at some point you might turn to alcohol or, or pills or just to quiet the whatever. noise because yeah. I put so much emphasis on doing stuff for other people 
And uh, those are things that I, I, I feel like I, I want to do and I can do. But if I'm not taking care of myself, I know where that goes. And so yeah. some days I have really good days. Some days are amazing and mm-hmm. everything just seems to click. And then some days we, you've mentioned before the mornings can be kind of hard for you. The mornings are really tough because I, I you know, for the past 25 years, I've been getting up at 430 in the morning, starting with radio <laughs> and then TV. It's so early. But my alarm clock still goes off and I'll wake up in the morning. I'll turn on the morning news. I'll see my friends. Yeah. Doing their job. And you're not there. And I'm not there. Yeah. And I can't be there. Mm-hmm. And it, it then that starts the negative thinking. Mm-hmm. And then that leads to how did I get where I am? What did I do? Mm-hmm. And then it leads to people coming, you know, trying to stop me from doing what I was doing. And I wasn't listening. And so that kind of just. It, it, so it kind of regrets. Do you feel like you regret a little bit not listening to people? I live with regret every day. Yeah. Every day I look at my kids and I don't have a car. And I've got to rely on neighbors and my ex-wife, and I got to get on a train. I'm also thankful for those things, mm-hmm. but I but they're they're constant reminders of yeah went went wrong. And I think that's one thing you're good at, Casey. Is um, you I I spend a lot of time as a cognitive therapist helping people reframe or look at problems and negative situations differently. Um, and I think I've as long as I've known you, you're pretty good at naturally doing that. So. That kind of loads on the optimism scale. Uh, so it's great that you can see the fact that your ex-wife is able to help you out as a positive, but that's tough. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> having to turn to your ex-wife to uh, get some help I have just to, getting to the grocery store. I have to turn to town. my girlfriend. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, I have to – I mean, it, it, my life is ten times harder now. Uh, I, I can't just run to the store and get milk. My son is sick right now, mm. and uh, my ex-wife sends me a text – we just gave him some Advil at 4 o'clock. You can give him some more at 8. I go down to the fridge. There's no Advil. Uh, and I don't have a, I don't have a, have ride, a ride to, go get to the store, yeah. you know. And so then I got to start going through the list of friends to call. And that's one thing that I don't do very well. I don't, I don't like to depend on people because I don't like to put people out, yeah. you know. And I'm always going, no, I'll figure this out. I'll figure this out. So it's really forcing me out of my comfort zone to rely on people and ask for help. And and I just I'm yeah. not very good at that. I like to be the guy that goes, I got this. I'll take care of this. Oh sure, yeah. I think most of us do, right? Um, so the mornings are kind of hard for you, and I think you kind of go through your reframing and you get busy, and then you kind of snap out of it, as far as I can tell. And by the afternoon or you know evening, you're kind of back to yourself. Um, do you think that pattern has helped you not drink because it's, I think you're drinking, you would get up early, go to work, and then it was the afternoon when you'd start drinking. Uh, you're getting down in the mornings a little bit and then kind of pulling it back by the afternoon. Do you think that's helping you not be so tempted to drink? Like if you think if it was reversed, if you were having a harder time in the afternoon, do you think it'd be a little more tempting to have a have a drink? Uh, yeah, maybe. I maybe because I would be isolated. But as my day goes now, I get up, I get the kids ready for school, uh, I Uber to the gym, uh, and, and I listen to some podcasts, listen to some music, and get a good workout in. Then I walk to the train station, yeah. and then I you all know, come in here twice a week. Uh, sometimes it's tough coming in here, and I mean they're all my friends still here at KSL. Oh yeah, and and everybody's nice, but I'm not in the group. Right. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. They're just, all busy running around doing their thing. Yeah, and, and I want to sit down in their offices and talk to them and go say hi to them, and they, you know, and, and they kind of give me the look as like, uh, we got to work, <laughs> you know, and and I'm just right. trying to kill time. Yeah. And so what I really try to do is keep myself busy from, you know, when my kids go to school, yeah, to when uh, my kids get home or my girlfriend gets done with work. Yeah, and I don't know if that's healthy, really, because. I'm just trying to, you know, keep myself busy until somebody else can keep myself busy. So I've really got to learn to... to... I think that's part of it. I mean, I mean, that is part of it. The type of drinking you did uh, took place when you were alone. Yeah. I, I mean, well, and with others. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, the, the, the problematic everyday drinking was mostly on your own. Yeah, isolation, hiding from yeah. people. And I would sit there and I would drink, and but I, I didn't like to be alone. So if I called you in the afternoon, chances are there was a beer in my hand. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? And I was I was texting you and I was calling, <laughs> yeah. 
you just yeah. couldn't see me, and I didn't want you to see me, but I didn't want to feel alone. So right. I was just calling everybody and texting everybody and, and living on social media, and it was just it, it was just an ugly time. What what about this? So I I didn't ask if I could ask you this either. You can but... ask me whatever you want. We run an honest program. <laughs> okay, good. So, but you mentioned the other day that, and I don't want to embarrass your girlfriend. I don't think this will. But you you went uh, for the first time since getting out of rehab. You went to a big family party mm-hmm. with your girlfriend and her family, and you'd mentioned you felt a little I don't know um, awkward or wondered what it was. socially they were drinking. You weren't drinking. Talk about that because I think that that's very real, man. Everybody th- that stops a behavior like that, and then you try to kind of go back and hang out with others, it can it can be a little, I don't know. Awkward. So I went. So I went to my girlfriend's family Easter party, and they were having some beers. And I went to my family Easter party the day before, and they were having some beers and some yeah. drinks. Okay. And the thing that, and it might just be the way I feel about myself. I don't want somebody to look at me. Like I'm broken or I'm all of a sudden at the kids' table. I don't want to have backroom conversations of like, well, Casey's coming over. Should we have alcohol? I don't know. I don't want them to adjust yeah. their lifestyle. I want you to be you. And and yeah. and, and, and I, because my mom, when I, when I got clean, she was like, well, honey, we won't have alcohol at the parties. And I go, well, that's not right. I said, mom, do you have a problem drinking? She goes, well, no. And I said, well, I do. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want you to change your life for me. I think that's great that you're willing to. Yeah. And and, yeah. and, and I and I th- think for some people, you know, you don't want to have that around, but I don't want to be treated different. And mm-hmm. that's the hardest thing. And I think it's probably just the way I feel inside is that they're probably not having conversations behind my back. They're probably not worried about that. Probably not. But I mean, uh, you never know, but it makes you feel how, like if they were having those conversations if everyone was debating should we not put out drinks like how would that make you feel like they don't trust me or they don't believe me yep. you, you know that 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 I, I i don't have this figured out maybe or that you're weak that i'm weak like uh three weeks ago uh caitlin birchall she was the morning uh reporter on ksl uh-huh. she was going away and this was right when the story came out about me and kind of what she was going away, like taking a different job. Or? Yeah, different job. She went to a Connecticut and they were having a going away party for her. Mm. And this is just right when uh, the story about me came out on KSL in the morning news and mm-hmm. we were launching this podcast. Mm-hmm. Well, they were having this going away party. I didn't get invited to that party. Well, I don't think you knew, Caitlin. <laughs> uh, they were having a party at the Westerner. It's a local bar here in Salt Lake City. Yeah. And she goes, I would really like it if you'd come. And I was like, yeah. I'd like to come. And so I called my girlfriend. I said, hey, let's go to this party. And she goes, it's at a bar. And I said, yeah. She goes, you're going to be okay? And I go, yeah, I'll be all right. You know, so I walk into this, the Westerner. It's this big country club. They've got a, yeah, I've never been there. They've got a mechanical bull in there. Wow. Uh, they do the line dancing. I mean, it's, it's all this stuff. And I walk in there, and there's a table of reporters there. Yeah. And my story just ran. And I walked in, and all these reporters <laughs> looked back at me. Looked at each other and were like, what is he doing here? Yeah. What is he doing here? You know, yeah. is this yeah. a good idea? They probably were talking about it. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so I walked up and I was like, hey. And they go, hey. And I was like, hey, I'm just here for the party, you know. But it was one of those things that, that I wanted to go, just because I had a problem with alcohol, does that mean that I can go to no one's going away parties ever again because they're yeah. at a bar? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and and so it, it's those kind of things that I'm not used to being treated like that. And I, and I know that they're caring and they're understanding but right, it, it comes from a good place. It comes from a good place, but I don't like getting treated like that. I don't like, right. and, and I don't know if it's just me or I don't know how to deal with it. But then I was like, and this was an honest, I said, hey, I'm going to go up to the bar. Does anyone want a drink? Mm-hmm. And I would have bought them an alcoholic drink. I would have bought whatever they wanted, yeah. y- you know, and I'm walking up to the bar. Yeah. And I get about halfway there, and I just do kind of a John Belushi turn back to him real quick. And they're all just staring at me like, you know, with these wide eyes like, what is he what doing? Is you yeah, know, and, and so I went up there, and I was like, hey, can I get a monster and a water? They yeah. didn't have me get him any drinks. Oh, okay. But, I, you know, I just wanted a monster and a water. Yeah, yeah. And I walked back, and I could just tell that they, they were, were like. They were observing, right? Yeah. Like, seeing what's going to happen. Yeah, what's going on? And yeah. and. You know, I, I talk about it all the time. 
because alcohol is everywhere. You know, especially in, yeah. in in my industry. I mean, mm-hmm. I DJ weddings, I DJ parties, and I do this, and it's everywhere. And we've talked about you thought about that choice you have. Do I give up my whole career? I can't. Right? You can't. I don't want to start over. Yeah. And I don't want to go through life taking a right turn every time there's alcohol served because that doesn't mean I fix the problem. That means that I'm avoiding the problem. Right. And, 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 and I don't want to avoid the problem. The problem wasn't the alcohol. The problem was me and why I was drinking and what I was doing. So I make mm. a conscious effort and decision that I'm not drinking. Yeah. And if the fact is that the only reason I'm not drinking is because it's not around – then I have That's not. A problem, right? Then I haven't yeah. fixed it, right. and I think that goes back to when I'm at the parties and people mm-hmm. are going, "Should we have alcohol here?" Yeah. Oh, yeah. Does that exactly. does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think in behavior change, you know, if we talk about it as like a study, when we study behavior change, people are successful in changing difficult behaviors when they don't just stop something, but they replace it. And so, for you, if you were just going to these things trying not to drink. Uh, that would be a problem. You're replacing it with you're you're um, a monster in a water, but mm-hmm. more than that, you're you're connecting with people there in a way that you probably throughout the night wouldn't have in the past because you're getting more and more sloshed. Blotto. Yeah, blotto. Yeah, it's a technical term. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And so that and so that's and I've replaced it with Jim. And there was a lot of things that I wondered if I was still funny or if I was still charismatic, if I was uh-huh. if I was still outgoing. If or, people would respond to you like they used to. And and you know, I tell my girlfriend and I say, Hey, you know, if you want to go dancing mm-hmm. she goes, You wanna go dancing? I was like, Yeah, let's go dancing. Let's go do something. I, I, I don't wanna just Sit around and feel like you can't go anywhere and do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I like that kind of people. I like yeah. the and raucous you, crowd. And a lot of your friends and family still do. Do that, yeah. And I you know, I finally got an email. But do you think it's a do you think it's dangerous at all? I mean, like I think people might be listening going, Yeah, but you know, in a moment of weakness, you know, it might be dangerous to are you really Sam alone, you know, working in the bar but drinking water? Is it dangerous? I don't know. I, I don't. It's for for me, it doesn't feel dangerous. Okay. If it felt dangerous, I wouldn't do it. Uh-huh. I'm not going up and, you know, ordering a shot and looking at it and having a face off with it and then turning <laughs> around. That would be dangerous. That's dangerous. Yeah. I, I When I walk into this place and I DJ at Maxwell's every Saturday night uh, downtown, I, 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 I'm and I've cleaned up the tables afterwards so we can get out earlier so I don't get home at 3 in the morning uh-huh. and dump out drinks. It, that uh-huh. that doesn't seem dangerous to me. Okay. Uh, and, and once again, this is my recovery, and this yeah. is the way I'm doing it. I know there are – You can see how for other people, though, they might feel like – for other people, they might feel like that's kind of dangerous for me to do that. But I've got something set in my brain that yeah. says I do not want this. I think you have made, you know, I think a lot of people talk about it and they want to do it. I think you've actually done it where you've made a real, uh, I think, personal commitment that, that this is just not what you do anymore. One of the things we did in uh, Pinnacle Recovery Center was uh, we asked ourselves a question. Is this thing I'm about to do going to get me closer to my goal Mm. or further away Mm -hmm. and that's the test i use in almost every decision i make yeah and i know where i want to be i want to be back on tv i want to be successful i want to be the father my kids had i i want to do all those things and if i take a drink and if i do this Mm -hmm. there's there's not a scenario in this world that by me taking a drink is going to get me any closer to that goal. Yeah. And and I and and for that, that's my resolute and that's what I want and that's what I'm going to do. And, and you still use that technique like I, every, ask yourself. every day, yeah. every day. I think that's I'm from a cognitive psychologist point of view. I mean, that's tremendous because you're using delayed gratification and you're processing the outcomes before you engage in something. And that's kind of the key to making good decisions in life. And I think most of the time when any of us have made bad decisions, it's because we haven't done that. And I made a ton of bad decisions with the help of alcohol. Yeah, it just gets wor- I mean, alcohol reduces your impulse control. Yeah. So the more drinks you have in you, the worse you are You are at that. I'm still impulsive and I still like to have fun and do that, but I don't let that get in my brain. And for some reason, it works. And I'm not, and yeah, if for those are out there that can't be rounded, we had this counselor up there. His name was Jumpin' Jay. We called him Joel. And, uh, you know, he said that, you know, 
it was a it was a dangerous line for him when he would go to parties. He said when he first went to mm. parties, he would stay in the kitchen, oh. and then he got more comfortable, and then he would move out to the living room where people are going. And then when he got real comfortable, he was out back where the people were smoking, and he was cognizant to go, ooh, mm-hmm. this is not good. I can see myself progressing up here. Okay. And I wasn't drinking, but I was getting more comfortable, and that scared him, and then he brought it back. Okay. And for me, I, I'm not scared to be around alcohol. I'm, I'm scared of failing. But you've got to have boundaries, and I think that's a lot of times where people— it's a tough, tough line. We've had some great um, messages and comments from listeners about— that very issue with their family members, you know, their own children, spouses, like when is enough enough? I mean, it's it's a, probably an individual basis issue, but it's, man, something that everybody struggles with. If you're on the other side of it now for a second, if we're talking about, you know, family members, friends, when do I give another chance? When do I not? I think part of making that decision is pausing what you're doing and, and looking at what the, the recovering person is doing. How do they have more skin in the game? Than you, they should. Yeah, and and if they do, maybe that's a maybe. I mean, it's every situation is different, but maybe that's a time where you say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna help them by giving another chance. But if you, the parent or the the spouse or the friend, if you've got more skin in the game of their recovery, then you probably need to say no. I just had a friend, and he's still my friend, and I'm still working with him. He's had a, he's had a rough go of it, and a couple of times he's messed up, and he finally just came back and he came to my house the other day, mm. and I sat him down and th- I said, "Listen, I have cared more about your recovery than my recovery. I have spent more sleepless nights with your recovery than my recovery." Mm. And that's not fair. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, I, I can't be around you. Did you start feeling like you were enabling him? Maybe like, a yeah, saving him. Uh, yeah, what, a little bit. Yeah. And that hurt me because somebody helped me. You can't save everybody. And you take it so personal. And I think on the other side of that coin is if you try to sell, save everybody, you're hurting yourself. Yeah, you're distracting from your own recovery. I think a lot of times we can think of ourselves in these situations as, uh, where's my foundation, right? If you think of a house, a home that has a really good, solid foundation, then you can build lots of different structures on it and they'll be good. If the foundation is rocky, it doesn't matter how much money and effort you put into the structure, it's going to fall apart and not be what you want it to be. And so a lot of times a person in, I mean, I think you said it really well, you're worrying more about his recovery than your own. That makes me worry about is your foundation getting shaky because you're not back on your own track. And so it's important to tell him that so that he realizes, oh, I'm not I'm not tending to my own foundation of my own recovery. Yeah, you can't build upon yeah. it. And I would say just I'll just I'll just play the psychologist for a second. Um, I would reframe that. It isn't selfish by by it's self oriented and self motivated. Um, building that foundation, making sure that you're solid so that you can kind of branch out and be supportive to others like your kids and family and friends, uh, that's that's kind of the opposite of selfish. It's taking time for yourself. And so I think we're raised in a culture where it that might sound selfish even just to talk about it. But if you you got to switch that in your mind. People need to switch that in their mind so they realize, I am doing something selfless. I'm getting my foundation stable so that I can branch out and support other people. And so by taking time for myself in, in this case, uh, re- your recovery, um, I am doing a really unselfish thing. I think the the, the term everybody's using nowadays is self-love. Um, <laughs> so I, other than that, I think I'm doing good. It's a struggle. Yeah, yeah. But it's struggle in every day is a different struggle. Yeah. So but I mean, I wanted to point out some of the patterns. I think some of the patterns that you're going through uh, – People relate to might benefit them noticing what times of day are difficult for you. If any of the listeners are in recovery, you know, paying, getting to know yourself better. You know, what are your weaknesses? What are your strengths in your recovery? I'm let's gonna, get to your. Yeah, let's get to your excessiveness. OK, so because this I want to talk about there. There's a way of describing this. So pe- but like you, you would describe your. So here's drinking a, as here's a conversation yeah. I had with my mom uh, probably, you know, for the past five years. You're an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. Will you binge drink? That's an alcoholic. No, Mom. Mm -hmm. I'm not an alcoholic. You're a binge drinker. And my mom is famous for Googling stuff. And so she Googled binge drinking. It's hard to argue with Google. And that's an alcoholic. And 
what she was. But in your mindset, what was an alcoholic at that time? Why were you saying no? Because when the conversation started, it was I would drink to excess on a Friday, on a Saturday, maybe mm-hmm. a Tuesday, or whenever. It wasn't five days a week. It wasn't seven days a week. It wasn't in the afternoon. It was whenever we were going to drink, it was to excess. Yeah. And so, but it wasn't every day. Yeah. I was getting up in the morning. I was doing my stuff. But if there was alcohol involved. I think a lot of people feel think the same. It's a misnomer. They think the same thing. Hey, if I'm not drinking every day, if I'm still getting up, going to work, you know, socializing, I'm a good dude, I'm doing my thing, then I'm not an alcoholic. You know, all my, So they don't see binge drinking all as All my alcoholism. friends would sit around and they'd go, you know, well, according to Google, if you drink more right. than three to five drinks in one sitting – Right. Twice a week, you are considered an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And we're like, no, that's no. An alcoholic is somebody who drinks every morning or sits on his back deck and drinks an 18 pack. That's an alcoholic. You know, right. we, you know, if we go out to dinner and we have three or four pitchers, that's not an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. You know? But technically, that's binge drinking, and binge drinking is considered a type of alcoholism. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they try to. They try to. Uh, operationalize what what that means, and so I'll just say what what Google would say if somebody. I usually it's usually says five for for men it's five drinks or more in two hours, or for women it's usually four because of body mass being a little bit smaller. BMI. Uh, yeah, there you go. Nice. Um, and so the the idea is you're getting your blood alcohol level up past point oh eight in two hours. Okay. If you want to think about it that way, uh, a, a less technical way to think about it is having a lot of drinks in a short period of time. Yeah. Right? And so if that's how you drink, if that's how a person drinks, which is pretty pretty much how you drink, then that's considered binge drinking. And binge drinking is um, the most common way people start drinking. If you think back to being an adolescent, being a teenager, kids aren't saying, oh, I'm going to have a glass of wine that with math my test PB&J. Was tough. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like people are going out to the keggers or they're snitching a bottle of, of booze from their parents or something and they're they're drinking to get drunk. Yes. And you don't take more than two hours to get drunk. You might not even take more than two minutes. No, because, I, you know, when I was a kid, the party didn't start till you were drunk. Right. That's what that was the purpose of drinking. Yeah. So yeah. you wanted to get drunk before the party. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pre-game. Yeah. There was never, I mean- like I said, there was you know there was never a class on how to be a man and be in touch with your feelings. There was never no. a class that they go, hey, look, uh, this is how responsible responsible people drink, um, right? They, no, no. In fact, I think fortunately and unfortunately, there's a lot of emphasis just on not drinking. There's really it's a gray area, and it, and it's 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 dicey talking with teenagers like here's how to drink responsibly. But maybe there should be more of that conversation. I think there should be also a conversation about. What's happening in your brain when you drink? And and again, the psychoeducation, educating people about this, sort of sinks in when you're old. But when you're a teenager, you don't want to hear it. But it's it's not necessarily not worth letting teenagers know. Listen, your brain is developing right now at a rapid, rapid pace, and that's going to happen until your early to mid twenties. And if you are teaching your brain to rely on alcohol uh, during that developmental time, your brain is actually very brilliant. And your brain, uh, it's, it's, it loads up information all the time, every day. And so if you're teaching your brain something like, hey, this is how I relax, this is how I have fun, this is how I deal with stress, you know, you mentioned like a test or, you know, this is what I sh- want to do, then your brain learns the emotional and psychological lesson, not just the negative impact on, I mean, it kills brain cells and all that, but you know what I mean? And so then by the time you're a young adult, what you've learned to do is drinking equals binge drinking, drinking equals drunk, and that's what I do in any of these situations. And those habits become so second nature for people. I understand wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we did in the Pinnacle Recovery Center was uh, we went, sober softball was the best thing ever. And But I hadn't played softball sober since I was probably 15. So they took us to all these things that I would normally do with, with beer. With beer. Or alcohol, yeah. With alcohol. And I would go, I had to teach myself that it was okay. I've said before on the podcast, going golf and sober right out of recovery was probably the biggest test for me, was the biggest test. Mm-hmm. When I went, I wasn't sure if I was going to, one, like golf, and I do, I still love golf, 
my my game's starting to get a little bit better. I had okay. to retrain uh, my swing. Uh, yeah, because you're not holding the beer anymore. If you felt like you golfed better when you were drinking and you won more money when you were drinking, I mean, I, I know that that's low on your priorities in life, but uh, somebody listening might say, well, I felt like that too, and and it was one of the reasons I wanted to drink when I golfed with my buddies, and that might have led them back down that path. It, but everyone's path is going to be different, right. and I enjoy h- hanging out with my father more than I do being drunk. I like the camaraderie. I mm-hmm. like getting out in nature. You know, right now I'm in a, a point in my life where I was talking to a salesperson over here the other day, and she goes, what do you like to do? And I had to ask myself, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't I, know. I'm <laughs> 45, and I'm trying to figure it out yeah. what I really like to do. I like to do a lot of those things because I could do it with a beer in my hand. Yeah. And so now, you know, whenever I was— You have to try them out again without beer and see if you still like them, I guess. When I was young and I'd meet someone at the club— I would be like, hey, how are you? And we'd start talking. I was like, hey, you know what? We should get up tomorrow and go hiking, you know, and, and go on a hike. <laughs> oh, that's smooth, Casey. I can tell you this. Yeah. Never once went on a hike. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it, you, I don't think that was your plan. But I probably had three or four girls afterwards go, hey, you said you liked hiking. Yeah, I don't like hiking. No, no. No, no. I'm not, not a big fan of hiking. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe I am a fan of hiking. Well, you got to get out and try it. Do you, are you making a purposeful effort? I haven't to yet. To try new things? Not to hiking, try, to but... try new things. Yeah. So to get back to binge drinking, I think most kids do start out binge drinking. Oh, yeah, And then absolutely. they carry that on to their adult life. Yeah, in fact, um, like, you know, uh, statistically, there was a 2017 at-risk youth study thingamajig, and they found that 14% of teenagers uh, who drank uh, were—14% or 14% of teenagers were binge drinking. That's a huge number of teenagers. Because when you say 14%, it doesn't seem like, but... But across the board, nationwide, that's a lot hundreds of-, of thousands of kids. And what we find is that binge drinking is highly associated not just with, uh, I mean, I'll, I, I could soften it, but I'll just say brain damage because it does damage your frontal lobe development and your ability for impulse control and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, if you have ADHD and you're drinking, your ADHD is going to get worse. And it's, it can be permanent. Because the brain is developing, and if you stop the brain from developing the things that would turn around your inattention, then it's you're never going to get it back, potentially. Um, but um, hundreds of thousands of kids are, are binge drinking, and that is highly associated with alcoholism, uh, binge drinking in college, and then binge drinking and alcoholism as an adult. And so one of the things I wanted to bring up today is what do parents do? Because... One of the things I do in my practice is talk with parents all the time about various issues with their kids. And a lot of times, and I've felt this way, I I assume you felt this way, when our kids have problems and struggles of various types, we try what we know, and then if it's not working, we don't really know where to go and what to do after that sometimes. So I wanted to go through kind of my list of things that I think are helpful for parents, whether, I mean, if your kid is a teenager, they're at risk for drinking, okay? Okay. Period. They're at risk for it. It's very common. Um, it, it, binge drinking is what kids think is fun and, and all that stuff we've talked about. If your kid's already drinking, then they're, they're definitely at risk for alcoholism and various forms of brain development delay and maybe even brain damage when, when they get older because they've stopped. And it can look subtle, but if, you, if your kid's already a little squirrely, you don't want them drinking because they're not going to get less squirrely. Does that make sense? Well, then how do you approach them? <clears throat> how do you approach your kids? Yeah. Well, number one thing I have on my list is parents, go back to something that we all know, and that is set a good example. Lock up your liquor. Lock it up. Don't have it out and about and easy access for the kids. And in your home, I, I'm a, I know that there's this trend with parents saying, well, if they drink at my house, then I know they're safe. And, and if I don't let them drink here, then they're going to go. It's like your kid's holding you hostage. No. You're right. On some level, your kid is going to do what your kid's going to do. Right. And as a parent, we have to accept that on uh, they're going to go to school. They're not going to go to school. They're going to whatever, whatever. But the reality is kids still, teenagers still are in that mode of wanting to be led and have an example. And they will listen. They'll, they'll make mistakes as well, but it makes an impact. So set a good example, lock up your booze. And stick to 21 for your kids. I think that's very, very important to let them know. And if they're like, well, that's lame, you're old-fashioned, you can always go back and if you're having that conversation, say, well, first of all, it's best for you and you have to trust me. Second of all, by the time you're 21, at least most of your brain development's done. And I'm not going to be responsible 
for leading you down a path that might wreck your whole life. Here's some advice from the Scott family. If you are going to lock up your liquor cabinet, put the hinges on the inside. (laughs) I'm just telling you from (laughs) From personal experience that the screwdriver gets you in pretty fast. Yeah, gets you in pretty, uh, pretty quick. And then two, I think you can hide behind the law as well and go, it's, it's the, the law. law. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. You know, I'm not going to put my family at risk. I mean, working here in the news, I've seen it so many times where they think that and the parents come and they get a ticket. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to risk a ticket so you can oh, drink yeah. here. Yeah. No, that's – yeah. And all you can get sued by other parents and all sorts of things. And I don't think there's any evidence – that just because your kid is drinking in your house, that they're not going to go out and cause havoc and problems. I mean, those kids are going to, when, when, I don't know if parents are aware of this, their judgment gets worse. Yes. So they're going to leave the house. They're going to go out and get in trouble and, and crash cars and do naughty stuff. And, and so you, you just don't want to be facilitating that. Number two is talk with your kids about drinking. Have an open dialogue. It, yeah, it's uncomfortable. I don't really like to talk to my kids about things that make us uncomfortable like sex, pornography, alcohol, drugs, but you've got to do it. And if you start young and your kid knows they can talk to you about those things, you don't get judgy, you don't get awkward, you you open yourself up, push yourself. Your parents probably didn't talk to you about that. Most most kids grow up and th- there wasn't an open dialogue about my this, dad but you had can a, be different. My dad had a pretty open dialogue That's with me. That's good. Yeah, and I know I think, he did. Yeah. And I think my mom would as well, but... There were some things I was just more comfortable talking to my dad, being man to man, you uh-huh. know. Uh, but I, t- I just had a conversation with my youngest daughter, Frankie, yesterday, and uh, I said, "Hey, look, I want to have a relationship where you can feel free mm. to tell me anything." And she goes, "Dad, I want to, but sometimes you're turning around and tease me, and and, and I don't like that." Okay, and, I, and so and, and did I you s- listen to that? Yeah, I said, "I said, okay, so mm. you know." I like to play with you back and forth. And she goes, yeah, but sometimes, Dad, it's just too much. And I was like, okay. And it, that really sunk in. I was like, ooh. Yeah, that's good. And if you can listen to that feedback, actually, that's not that uncommon. Some of the ways we as dads relate to our kids is through teasing because that's probably a lot of our personalities. And it can go too far and it can shut down that dialogue and that conversation. So, I'm, yeah, I'm glad. That's really cool that she would tell you that, yeah. actually. And even better that you'll, you'd listen and change your behavior. I think a lot of times parents aren't willing to change their behavior based on their kids because they kind of think, well, the kids should do what I tell them or how we do it. But you, it's, it's a two-way street if you want to have a good relationship with them at least. Um, on, kind of on a – we talked about locking up your liquor. I also say this is a huge problem for kids. Go through your house, get rid of old prescriptions, uh, lock up prescriptions that are opiate-based or benzodiazepines, those sorts of things. So anything that's abusable, uh, make sure it's locked up and put away. Old stuff needs to be thrown away. Uh, another thing is uh, this is actually fairly good way to start the dialogue. The next step is if you know your kid's already started drinking, if if they've gotten drunk at a party or they've snitched something from your cabinet, whatever, um, have have kind of a, you know, a, a normal health checkup with the pediatrician and prep prep the doc ahead of time to say, will you go over that with them? And sometimes in the doctor's office with the doctor as an authority talking and just reiterating what maybe you've already told them, it opens up the dialogue. Tell the doctor you're saying, I don't want you to scold my kid. We're not here to make him feel ashamed. We just want to open up a dialogue. And sometimes that doctor visit can be the first step to then having an open dialogue at home. And, you know, I think sometimes having somebody other than the parent talk to the kid about something important makes it a little more impactful. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, rather than you're just saying that because you're a stuffy old man and you don't want me to have fun. Mm -hmm. And the doctor's like, well, no, science actually says that these things can happen and lead to this. And so, yeah, I I like that. I have two more things and then we'll wrap it up. One, it seems a little off off track, but um, check with your insurance, especially during your renewal period. Does do you have the option of including while your kids are growing up? Things like mental health and and treatment for these sorts of things. And you might say, well, my kid doesn't have a problem with that. But once you find out that he or she does and you don't have insurance to cover it, then a lot of kids don't end up getting treatment. And sometimes just having a therapist to go in and talk to about how mad they're at mom and dad and they won't let them drink and having a different place to process that really can help a kid learn to reframe and think differently about their behavior and what they're doing. And then the last thing is, and I know this may seem less powerful than the problem, but start uh, doing activities of exercise and things with your kids, like meditation, hiking, 
uh, go out and teach them how to manage their stress and anxiety in ways that are healthy and fun. And I know that seems not directly related, but it is so important because a lot of the kids that I work with and talk to who have gotten into problems, they don't have that relationship, first of all, with their parents. Their parental relationship isn't based on fun anymore like it was when they were little. And they don't have other things that they love to do uh, to help them through that time of adolescence when you're stressed. And so if you can teach your kid to love um, rock climbing or mountain biking, skateboarding, skateboarding. My kids and I, my daughter just asked me the other day, uh, two days ago, can we go skateboarding this weekend? And you know what? That's to me as a dad, that it's just skateboarding. But to me, it's like, man, we, we have that as something we do together and it's healthy and it's active. Um, if you don't know how to meditate as a parent, get a meditation app and do some of those. I was talking to a parent this week who uh, her son <laughs> said, hey, mom, can we meditate before bed? And I think he was just milking it to stay up a little bit later, but that's okay. So they laid down and they listened to Headspace and they went through a guided meditation and they've been doing it, I think, three nights now this week. And so these are these are some things. If you're a parent, you feel stuck. Um, Feel free to reach out, send us a message. Yeah, Facebook's and, and a great place to do it. We'd love to get uh we'd love to give you any more advice if we can on things to do, but but listen to those things. Don't ever feel like as a parent there's nothing you can do um because there's a there's a ton you can do. Sometimes we just get scared as parents and we back off. And doing nothing is the worst thing you could do. Oh, it's it's way better to try and fail than to do nothing. Yeah. Hey, I know this show's been all over the board, but it was good for me just to get a lot of things well, I, out. I think it was fun to sit and talk and yeah. just kind of see how you're doing. And... I, I like that. And if you can't afford Headspace app, just get an Enya CD. An Enya CD. There You'll be you good go. to go. Yeah, That'll help yeah. you meditate. Hey, uh, we want to say thank you very much. I want to say thank you to Pinnacle Recovery for helping me start my road to recovery. And don't forget, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. It's Project Recovery. We want to say thanks to John Smith. He's been diligently running the board back there. And uh, we want to say thanks to Dr. Matt Woolley. I'm Casey Scott. This is Project Recovery, a KSL podcast. We love you. The contents of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.